Hello and welcome to the Sci-Fi Christian Book Review. So not exactly a book review, so I'll explain in a moment. Brought to you by the sci Christian.com. I'm Bendy Bono. And uh, I'm excited. This is going to be a little different project than uh, what we've done in the past with the book stuff here on the YouTube videos. Um, what this is going to be is less review, more analysis, and analysis spread over several videos, in this case of Paradise Lost. Uh, if this turns out to go well and you guys like it, I'll hopefully do this with some other um, more robust works like this. Uh, I've done a couple of videos of the Iliad and the Odyssey as a whole in the past, but in some ways those feel very dissatisfying to me because there's just so much to cover uh, and you, you can't do it justice in a 10 minute video or whatever. So for Paradise Lost, I decided we're not going to do that, we're going to do it a couple books at a time and uh, we're going to, you know, if it, we'll see how that goes as far as doing two books in, in uh, a single video. If these turn out to get kind of long or I feel like there's a little more to talk about with one of the books in the future, we might uh, adjust that some. Uh, but for the moment, we're covering books one and two tonight. So Paradise Lost. Uh, so I was inspired to reread this by uh, David Clements, who is the co-host of the Geek This podcast. He posted on Facebook that he was re reading Paradise Lost, I believe for the first time. Oh, I want to reread Paradise Lost. It's, man, it's such a great poem. So seeing somebody else is reading it, I just uh, got excited and dove into it for myself. So what we're gonna kind of do with this is gonna be a little bit more akin to the Game of Thrones videos, if you've ever watched any of the Game of Thrones reviews where in the Game of Thrones what we kind of do is we go through the whole episode and talk about things along the way and I want to do that similar format here with Paradise Lost. Uh, we'll go through the events of each book and kind of talk about stuff along the way uh, that I think is noteworthy. Do a little introduction to the poem as well here in this first video. Uh, as far as what level this is at. I should know that while I do have an undergraduate English degree and did study this poem in college, I'm by no means a scholar uh, of Milton, Paradise Lost, or Epic Poetry. Uh, I'm not an academic in this area. My, my academic expertise is not in Epic Poetry uh, or English. Um, and so this is not so much going to be a scholarly uh, research dump as it is. I'm an amateur, big fan of this type of thing. Love epic poetry, love Milton. Uh, so I'm coming at it from somebody who, yeah, has done some research, but I don't claim to have everything about this poem figured out. So feel free to chime in with your own additions, corrections, whatever in the comments, and let's just have a good time reading through this poem together and discussing it. Uh, the other thing I'm going to note is that as far as what I'm going to focus on, I am aware that the historical setting of Paradise Lost, as well as Milton's own um, historical actions, especially his political actions, play a big part in how you can interpret this poem. Those are not areas, though, where I'm qualified or prepared to comment on, so while I might point something out here or there, just be aware that I'm not going to talk about that stuff a ton, but I am aware that it's there. And again, if you are somebody who does know more about that and want to chime in on the comments uh, with some additional insight into the political dimension of this poem, that would be fantastic. So please feel free to um, do so and kind of round out what I'm talking about. All right, so John Milton. 17th century Protestant, but we won't hold that against him, right? A little Catholic humor. Uh, he was blind when he uh, wrote this poem, so he actually dictated the whole thing. So a little John Milton trivia there. Uh, and like I said, we're not going to get into a ton of his life and everything, but uh, suffice to say, he was kind of at the center of a lot of, uh, or maybe not at the center, but he was involved in a lot of British politics back in the day. I believe it was 60 when he wrote Paradise Lost. Uh, so this was a pretty major work for him that came later in his life. The poem we could look at, the poem itself, of course, is about the fall of Satan and the subsequent fall of Adam and Eve. 
And I think that this is a fascinating work because it takes biblical material and aspects of the Christian tradition, but it also exists as kind of a form of Christian mythology on its own. You know, if you've ever done a study into Satan or anything like that, as far as the biblical teaching on Satan versus what Christians tend to believe, you know that the evidence for what exactly went on with Satan and his fall and everything is pretty thin from a biblical perspective. Now, we can get into church tradition and all that, but just for simplicity's sake, uh, there's a lot of mythology within the Christian uh, tradition uh, regarding the character of Satan, regarding the fall of Satan. And Milton really picks up on a lot of that. And uh, I think that if you, it, what's funny is that if you were to read the biblical evidence for the fall of Satan, you would find very, very little, and what's there would only kind of sort of conform to what most people would think of as the fall of Satan. Whereas if you were to read Milton, it's actually very familiar to the story I think a lot of us think about when we, we consider what's involved with the fall of Satan and everything. So this exists very much in the realm of Christian mythology. But it also has a complex relationship to mythology outside of the Christian tradition, especially Greek mythology, and especially, especially the works of Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, so we're going to see a lot of that going on. Uh, but a couple of things I want to call out here from the start before we actually get into the first couple books. And that is that uh, Milton has a very complex relationship with Homer and the Greek myths. Uh, he both wants to honor Homer, to respect those great poems, but then he also kind of shifts into more of a polemical mode at different points in Paradise Lost. We'll get into some of those later on. Uh, but in the introductory stuff, we can kind of see here a couple ways that he's honoring Homer. Homer. And the first is that the, it's very intentional. If you look at Paradise Lost, the way that it's structured, he uses a similar verse format to Homer, but then he also has Paradise Lost is composed of 12 books. Why 12 books? Well, because the Iliad and the Odyssey are each 24 books. And when Virgil writes the Aeneid, he writes it in 12 books. So he is doing that as a sign of deference to Homer. He cuts his number of books in half, and Milton follows Virgil in that practice and does the same thing. Interesting side note for those of you who are Lord of the Rings fans that, well, I don't have any concrete proof of this. This is actually my conviction of why the Lord of the Rings is six books, that Tolkien's doing a similar thing. Now, before you comment, I didn't misspeak there. I know what you're thinking. The Lord of the Rings is a trilogy. It's not six books. Well, not really. It's a trilogy by publishing necessity. But Tolkien wrote it as a single volume that, when you actually look inside, is divided into six books. If you open up a copy of Lord of the Rings or, you know, of the individual, you know, three books, you'll see that Fellowship of the Ring is divided into book one and book two, Two Towers, three and four, and Return of the King, five and six. So it's my belief that Tolkien is doing something similar to what Milton and Virgil did, which is having his number of books in order to show deference to these other writers of epic poetry. I can't prove it, but given Tolkien's level of knowledge of these works, his appreciation and love for them, uh, I, I am fairly confident, as confident as I can be without some bit of concrete evidence that that is what's going on. Okay, so there we see a bit of honor uh, going to Homer, but then the other question we have to consider up front before we get into the books themselves is what's going on with the character of Satan in uh, Milton. So if you're not familiar with this debate, one of the biggest topics in Milton's scholarship is whether or not Satan is actually the hero of the poem. You say, well, why would Satan be the hero of the poem? Uh, well, because Satan occupies the same role in this poem as Achilles does in the Iliad, as Odysseus does in the Odyssey, and as Aeneas does in the Aeneid, okay? Satan occupies that central role of the heroic character. So what's going on there? Well, you know, some people would say, well, that means that 
Milton intends for Satan to be the hero. And some people will say, well, no, of course not. That's absurd. I want to throw out four possible answers for you. Uh, and, and you can kind of make up your own mind. I'll give you my opinion here in a second, but you can make up your own mind about what's going on here. The first answer is that, yes, Satan is the, t the hero of the poem, and intentionally so. Milton is putting Satan as the hero of this epic and uh, wants us to realize it, wants us to sympathize with Satan, uh, and wants us to um, be on board with what Satan's doing. I find this to be the most unlikely of the four possibilities I'm going to present to you. Why? Well, it just doesn't jive with Milton's religious sensibilities. A uh, very religious guy uh, would not have wanted us to walk away from this poem uh, being on board with Satan. And I think there's enough other things going on here that we'll see along the way that certainly contradict that. Okay, second option would be no, Satan isn't the hero of the poem, and any evidence given uh, to support that idea is just pure coincidence. And again, I think this is unlikely, because I think that Milton repeatedly shows throughout this, this poem just how aware he is of Homer, uh, of the style of the epic, of the structure of the epic, and he's not going to just it's too big of a coincidence for it to be an accident like that for to suppose Milton's just completely unaware of what he's done doesn't fly with me all right um so third option would be oh maybe I mix these up so that would be that yes um uh the so what I just described the reasons against that, I'm sorry, I mixed this up. That would be yes and that uh, it's unintentional. So then the third reason would be no and those pieces of evidence, they're just coincidence, we shouldn't read anything into them, uh, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and again, you know, so those two kind of fit in the same category for me. I don't think that those quite fit, either saying that no, Satan isn't the hero and the reasons are just coincidence, or yes, he is, but it's unintentional on Milton's part. I, I think Milton's too smart to do that. So my answer then is that no, Satan is not the hero, but the evidence is intentional on the part of Milton, and he's doing it as a polemic against the traditional role of the hero, the hero of Iliad, Odyssey, Aeneid, being somebody who seeks glory for himself, which is very much what Satan has attempted to do. And I feel like part of what Milton is trying to say is that's an improper thing to be doing, especially when your opponent is God, as it is in this case. So I feel it's a bit of a polemic against the old Homeric uh, epics, and, uh, but it's still very intentional on Milton's part that Satan is in that role. So you can decide for yourself. One last thing on the structure, very briefly, is that we begin this, this uh, poem in medias res, which is Latin for in the midst of things, which if you've ever read the Iliad, Odyssey, Aeneid, once again, all of those begin in the middle of the story. Later on in the story, we get the events that led us up to that point. And then finally we get the conclusion. We're going to see the same thing in Paradise Lost. We begin with Satan being kicked out of heaven. He's already, he's already been kicked out of heaven. He's in hell at the beginning of the story. Later on we will find out the events that led him to rebel against God and what happened at the war in heaven. And then finally we'll see the resolution of what goes on with the temptation of Adam and Eve on earth. All right. So with that said, let's get to it. Book one. Book one. And right from the beginning, we have a very interesting moment for Milton and for his relationship to Homer. Where is that, you might ask? Well, it's the invocation of the muse. So just like Homer does, and I believe like Virgil does, so I would have to double check that, uh, this poem begins with the um, invocation of a muse. You know the classic, sing me, O oh muse, blah, 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 blah. Uh, you know the drill, or at least, you know, if you're not familiar with it, you've probably heard it parodied at some point. Uh, if you want to know what I'm talking about, just open up and read the first paragraph of the Iliad or the Odyssey, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. There's an invocation of the muse to help the author tell the story that's about to be told. And this is very interesting, because at Obviously, Milton's doing this to echo Homer and to pay homage to Homer. But 
What's curious about this is later on in book one, and I'll, I'll comment on this a bit more in a moment, uh, but Milton directly associates all of the different gods of mythologies and other religions, you know, all the non-Christian gods. He associates them directly with demons. So within the world of this poem, Zeus and Odin, and I don't think Odin's directly called out, but the, the you know, the pattern fits that Zeus and the ancient gods, the Egyptian gods, all, you know, biblical false gods, Dagon, all these guys, uh, Baal, all of them are actually real within the world of this poem, but they are real as demons, okay? And what's interesting about that is that the muse is a god or goddess. The muses are goddesses within Greek mythology, not on the same level as Zeus and Athena and Hera and all those guys, but uh, they are certainly divine. They are certainly immortal. So in a sense, to use his own logic, Milton is invoking the help of a demon here at the start of the poem to help him tell this story. And again, we have a few possible options for how we are supposed to interpret that. Uh, I think you could read it as kind of a meta moment in the poem that we haven't actually entered the world of the story yet where the muse would be considered a demon. So we're kind of a step above still where Milton the poet invoking the muse is not a part of the world of the poem so that he can do so without actually calling on a demon to help him tell the story, okay? Or, if you happen to be on board with the theory that Milton does want us to sympathize with Satan, well, this would be a pretty big uh, point in your favor that you could use. You could argue that this is exactly evidence of Milton's sympathy for the devil, if you will that not only is Satan the hero, and intentionally so, but Milton wants to tell his story, and to do so, he invokes a demon. Or you can say, it's just a nod to Homer, and we're all reading too much into it. Those are kind of the three main options, I think. You know, I tend to, to say that, you know, Milton isn't ignorant of what he's doing, but it is kind of that more of a meta moment. It's meant to be a moment of homage, and we're not meant to necessarily connect it to that moment later in book one where we get the lists of demons. Okay. So, Satan and company are in hell. They, are, they have been cast out of heaven, and they've been chained up in hell, and their chains are loosed. Now, brief bit of fun trivia for you comic book fans out there. Uh, pay close attention to the type of material that the chains are made of that hold Satan and the other demons. They are adamantine, which is not exactly the same as the adamantium claws that Wolverine has in the X-Men comics, but is certainly an etymological ancestor to those. So. You know, if you want to have some fun with that as a comic book fan, go ahead. Certainly not a major point of analysis for the poem, but I thought that given that we're the sci-fi Christian, I'm no doubt some of you are comic book fans, I'd throw that out for you. Uh, adamantine also comes out later as one of the material, the material used for, I believe, the last three gates of hell that we'll see at the end of book two. Essentially, it's just meant to be an unbreakable type of metal, okay? Satan and Beelzebub uh, wake up, you know, they're out of their chains, they kind of start talking to each other. This is where we get that classic line in their whole dialogue, better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. Um, one of Milton's many, many great quotable lines. And then later on, so they kind of go and they gather all the demons and everybody, you know, we're getting the band back together. And then we get the listing of the demons that I alluded to a little bit earlier, where all the gods are directly linked to demons. I think I got that stupid mosquito there. It is summer in Minnesota and I'm outside of my garage. Uh, so if you see me swatting at something, that's what. Uh, anyway, now the listing of the demons is also very significant because it is a direct call out to the very famous catalog of ships from book two of the Iliad. So the second half of book two in the Iliad, Homer essentially lays out, here's this guy, you know, here's all the Greeks and all the Trojans that have shown up uh, to fight in this battle. Of course, the catalog of ships is primarily referring to the Greeks, 
um, but the Trojans get their own list in there as well. So very direct parody uh, or very direct call out depending on how you want to look at it, but something that's important to be aware of as far as if you're reading that and you're thinking why do we have to list all these demons, that's why. And then it also serves as that polemic to establish what all these other gods are within the mythological world of Paradise Lost. Okay, so we get all the demons together. Uh, the castle that they, the palace is built uh, almost instantly. And then we get um, maybe Milton's most famous neologism, pandemonium, pandemonium. Pandemonium does not mean just chaos. It literally comes from Greek and means all, pan, all, demons. So all demons. Milton coins this term, and this is where our English word pandemonium comes from. So if you use the word pandemonium in casual conversation, be aware that you're essentially describing a situation that is so uh, horrible, so chaotic, that it's the work you're saying is the equivalent of the work of all the demons. So uh, a very strong term and uh, you know it's good to have a little etymology on, on the, the words that we're using. So palace gets built, the demons are sitting pretty down in hell, and then it is time to decide, what are we going to do? How do we get back at God? Uh, and the choices Satan gives are, do we be covert or do we strike at heaven? All out war or do we kind of go behind the scenes? And that brings us to book two. Now, book two is one of those places that I mentioned where I'm not going to comment on it because I don't have the knowledge, but I do believe that Milton is trying to parody political discourse here, or maybe comment on its futility. If somebody knows more more about that, um, is certainly mention so mention it in the comments, give us your insight. Um, but certainly, what's going on here? We have this kind of political council taking place in hell as we decide what we're going to do. And four different demons speak. We have Moloch who advises it's all-out war. We have Belial, who essentially says, eh, let's not piss God off any more than we already have. Let's just kind of hang out here until he cools down a little bit. So Belial essentially says, let's do nothing. We have Mammon, who says, well, we could go with this other option, which is that we don't go and attack God, but we kind of build our own empire here, one that will hopefully eventually rival heaven. And then finally we get uh, Beelzebub, who we are told is actually giving Satan's uh, idea and giving voice to what Satan's told him to say, which is that, hey, there's this place called Earth. There's humans there made in God's image. Let's go corrupt them and take over the earth. Okay. Something very interesting that I think is going on here, and I can't prove this. Um, I haven't been able to find references to it, um, but I'm pretty sure that this is what's going on if you read this closely, is that each of these four arguments is meant to represent one of the seven deadly sins, okay? So Molech in advising war represents the sin of wrath. Belial, do nothing, uh, advises the sin of sloth. Mammon advises pride, you know, let's build an empire to rival heavens as though that would be possible, especially from hell. Uh, it's a very prideful statement. And then let's go steal the earth and corrupt the humans would be envy and lust. Now, you could probably also shoehorn gluttony and greed into one of those uh, uh, as well, but for me, I think that's very intentional, and I think Milton's also trying to show us how one of the seven deadly sins leads to the other, because all of these arguments are kind of linked. So Moloch's argument for all-out war is, look, things are as bad as they've already gotten. You know, what else is God gonna do to us? He already kicked us out of heaven what do we have to lose? Okay, but then that argument leads to sloth because Belial says, well, well, let's, let's hold our horses there. Um, remember how we were all chained up a good 10 minutes ago? 
you know, let's not go back to that and let's not really find out if God has something worse than hell that he could cast us into. So let's do nothing. And then that argument leads to, you know, well, Mol or Mammon's argument of let's build the empire because doing nothing isn't a good idea, uh, you know. And so these arguments become linked between all of the demons. One sin leads to the other. So I do believe that Milton is attempting to comment for us on the nature of the seven deadly sins, okay? Um, I think that there's also evidence for this in the fact that Belial and Mammon's speeches are pretty closely related. And that, at least for the purposes of the story, there doesn't seem to be a reason to have two different speeches here, but there is a reason if Milton's doing something like this, where he's commenting on or trying to uh, get in more of the seven deadly sins and draw a distinction between sloth and pride. Otherwise, uh, Mammon's argument could also be an answer to Molex, and for a time it kind of seems like that's where Belial is going, and then he just sort of stops. You know, he starts with the things could get worse, let's not press our luck, and then it seems like he's going to build to what Mammon is going to suggest of let's make things good here, but instead he just kind of stops and says let's do nothing. And then Mammon sort of picks up the ball and says, well, we don't have to just do nothing. We could, you know, we've already built this awesome palace of pandemonium here in hell. Uh, let's keep going that way and see what else we can do. So I kind of see their speeches as being very linked and the distinction between them comes from which sin the demon in question is supposed to represent of the seven deadly sins. Could I be totally off base there? Absolutely. If you think I am, I would love to hear um, other interpretations or counter arguments, but that to me is what stands out very strongly when I read that section. Okay, so council's over, we're going to earth, Satan's the one going to Earth because, again, he's in that heroic role, you know. You know, it's kind of throws it out there. Who wants to go to Earth and check things out? Nobody volunteers, so Satan volunteers himself. Again, very much an Achilles-type moment where who wants to beat down the Trojans while, well, the, you know, all the, the Greeks are trying to do so and they fail miserably. It's not until Achilles comes back into the battle that things start to turn around, eventually leading to the sack of Troy, which of course is outside the bounds of the story of the Iliad. But nevertheless, that series of events starts with Achilles' return to battle. Same type of thing here, you know, to actually accomplish the goal in question of corrupting humanity and taking over the earth, none of the other demons are qualified. It's going to take Satan to do that, so he's very much in that heroic Achilles-type role uh, right here at, at the beginning of events. But in the meantime, the other demons head out to explore earth, um, or ex explore hell, excuse me, and we get some more references to mythology. There's four rivers that they find in hell, which are references to the uh, Greek underworld and kind of other mytho mythological underworlds. Um, I also kind of wonder if that's meant to show hell as a parody of Eden, because in Genesis 2, Eden is described as, I can't remember if it's the meeting point or something, but there's four rivers either leading into Eden or flowing out of it or something like that. There's four rivers that are associated with Eden in Genesis 2, and we get a very similar thing going on here in hell as the demons kind of, where are we? Let's go explore our land. Uh, so I, I have a hard time seeing that as coincidental. Uh, it could be. It could be that Milton's just trying to comment on, again, associate um, hell with mythological underworlds, but I think that the number of rivers four and then four in Eden is not coincidental. I think he's doing both things, parody of Eden and this is the underworld of classical mythology. Okay, Satan then heads to earth and we get the very interesting scene of the conflict at the gate. So there's two figures at the gates. There's a lady uh, who is no, you know, scales and stuff on her bottom half and barking in her belly, uh, which will is very bizarre, but we'll get an explanation for it in a moment, a very twisted explanation. 
and then we get a figure that is pretty much undescribable according to Milton. Turns out these are Sin, the lady, and Death, the creepy figure guy. And Death and Satan are about to square off because Satan wants to get through the gates, of course, and they are about to kind of go head to head, and then Sin steps in and says, whoa, guys, we don't need to fight. In fact, this is a family reunion, right? So then we get the really twisted story of Sin, apparently, springs from Satan's head. Now, if that seems really weird to you, what's going on there is that's a parody of Zeus and Athena. The way Athena is born of Zeus is she springs out of his head. Sin does the exact same thing. So another connection to Greek mythology going on here. And then uh, Satan and Sin get it on incestuously. So remember, Sin is Satan's daughter at this point. They get it on and have death. Then death rapes his mother, Sin, in an ultra incestuous moment and that kind of gives birth to the Cerebus dogs that are barking in her womb. Okay, George R. R. Martin, eat your heart out when you go, start going on about incest and messed up sexuality, you've got nothing on Milton. I mean, this is one screwed up scene. And, you know, I think it's worth pausing and commenting here because I, I did draw the comparison to Game of Thrones. Uh, and George R. R. Martin, and you know, I think it's at least worth pointing out that in terms of Christianity, we, we get into these big debates of, you know, should Christians watch stuff or read stuff that has uh, strong sexual content in it or whatever. Well, here you go. One of the great works of Christian content, uh, of Christian literature, and we just had the description of a father-daughter incest giving birth to a, another child who then rapes his mother. Okay? So, to me it drives home the point that can Christians watch and read that stuff? Yeah. It's not so much about the content itself, it's about what the story is trying to say with the content. And that is what gets lost in all of these content debates, all of these family-friendly debates that go on within Christianity. Is it, is it really, really messed up? Yes. Is it really, really disturbing? Yes. Should it disgust us and horrify us to read that? Yes. But it's there for a purpose. Now, the debate about whether or not that stuff is there for a purpose in other media, other stories, that's a discussion for a different day. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Okay, and so that can be a complex discussion. But what I'm talking about is that when we as Christians simply write something off because it has a really messed up, freaky, disgusting sex stuff going on, um, we're thinking very shallowly. In this case, if we slam the book on Paradise Lost because of what we just read, we've missed the point that what Milton's trying to say is this is how messed up sin is. This is where sin and death come from. And it's this incestuous, disgusting, violent marriage between these three. And there's also a parody of the Trinity in this moment, right? You know, that it becomes Trinitarian in the sense that... Um, just as the Son proceeds from the Father and the Spirit from the Father and the Son, so we have Athena proceeding from Zeus, and then as a result of their incest, death proceeds from both of them. Okay, uh, so very much a parody of the Trinity. Uh, now, of course, the parody breaks down because they are not truly three in one, but that itself is part of the point that Milton is trying to show us that, and this is where we get one of those hints that he isn't really sympathizing with the devil, but putting Satan in that heroic role in order to comment on it, is that say, evil can only parody good. It can never actually duplicate it. You know, Satan, sin, death parody the Trinity in the most revolting, disgusting, twisted way imaginable, but they can never duplicate it. They are not the Trinity. They are not an unholy trinity. At best, they are a mere shadow of it. Very powerful moment in, the, in this story, if you realize it. All right. 
So once we've got our family reunion over with, sin and death, more than happy to help. They open up the gates. Satan makes a few more allies. Chaos, night, confusion, and discord as he's flying over to Earth. And then in a bit of high metaphor, we have sin and death kind of building a bridge behind him uh, from hell to Earth so that the journey will be a little easier next time. Uh, but yeah, again, a very strong moment uh, there by Melton of commenting on that sin and death literally paved the road from Earth to hell. And that ends book two. All right, guys. So, um, fascinating stuff. I mean, this is a poem that if you've never read it before, uh, do yourself a favor. It, it is absolutely brilliant. I'm looking forward to talking through the rest of the poem with you. Uh, let me know what you think. Let me know any insights you've got uh, into Milton, into Paradise Lost books one and two. And we'll talk to you a little later in this week when I've read the next couple books. But for now, this is Ben DeBono for the Sci-Fi Christian. Goodbye.